I invite you to turn in your Bibles to the book of Acts once again, Acts chapter 8. We're in a series here at Redeeming Grace working through uh, the book of Acts. We find ourselves in chapter 8 starting at verse 9, Acts 8 verse 9, and we'll read and consider the rest of this chapter this afternoon. Acts chapter 8, beginning at verse 9, hear God's word to us. But there was a man named Simon who had previously practiced magic in the city and amazed the people of Samaria, saying that he himself was somebody great. They all paid attention to him, from the least to the greatest, saying, This man is the power of God that is called great. And they paid attention to him, because for a long time he had amazed them with his magic. But when they believed Philip as he preached good news about the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Even Simon himself believed, and after being baptized, he continued with Philip. And seeing signs and great miracles performed, he was amazed. Now when the apostles at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent to them Peter and John who came down and prayed for them, that they might receive the Holy Spirit. For he had not yet fallen on any of them, but they had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then they laid their hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. Now when Simon saw that the Spirit was given through the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money, saying, Give me this power also, so that anyone on whom I lay my hands, may receive the Holy Spirit. But Peter said to him, May your silver perish with you, because you thought you could obtain the gift of God with money. You have neither part nor lot in this matter, for your heart is not right before God. Repent, therefore, of this wickedness of yours, and pray to the Lord that, if possible, the intent of your heart may be forgiven you. For I see that you are in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. And Simon answered, Pray for me to the Lord, that nothing of what you have said may come upon me. Now when they had testified and spoken the word of the Lord, they returned to Jerusalem, preaching the gospel to many villages of the Samaritans. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Rise and go towards the south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a desert place. And he rose and went. And there was an Ethiopian, a eunuch, a court official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of all her treasure. He had come to Jerusalem to worship and was returning seated in his chariot, and he was reading the prophet Isaiah. And the spirit said to Philip, Go over and join this chariot. So Philip ran to him and heard him reading Isaiah the prophet and asked, Do you understand what you are reading? And he said, How can I, unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. Now the passage of the scripture that he was reading was this, Like a sheep he was led to the slaughter, and like a lamb before its shearers is silent, so he opens not his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who can describe his generation? For his life is taken away from the earth. And the eunuch said to Philip, About whom, I ask you, does the prophet say this? About himself or about someone else? Then Philip opened his mouth, and beginning with this scripture, he told him the good news about Jesus. And as they were going along the road, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, See, here is water. What prevents me from being baptized? And he commanded the chariot to stop, and they both went down into the water, Philip and the Ethiopian, Philip and the eunuch, and they baptized him. And when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord carried Philip away, and the eunuch saw him no more, and went on his way rejoicing. But Philip found himself at Azotus, and as he passed through, he preached the gospel to all the towns until he came to Caesarea. This is the word of the Lord. Let's take a moment to pray, ask for God's help as we consider this, this portion of his word this afternoon. Father, we thank you 
so much that you speak to us. We thank you for your revelation to us that in these words we see you. We're pointed to Jesus. Lord, and as we seek to understand what you are saying to us in this passage, as we seek to understand what it means for our lives, what it means for us today, we ask that you would be gracious to us in, in giving us understanding. Lord, that your Holy Spirit that was poured out on the Samaritans would be working in our hearts, drawing us to you, pointing us to, to what we need to hear, and shaping our hearts uh, through your word. We ask for your grace in this. I ask that you would be near to each and every one of us. We pray this all in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Well, in the few hours, one of the biggest sporting events in North America is about to take place. Anyone want to take a stab at what that is? You can just shout it out. The Super Bowl. The Super Bowl. In a few hours, the Kansas City Chiefs and the San Francisco 49ers are going to go head-to-head for the NFL championship. And it's an event that draws a lot of anticipation. It draws a lot of viewers. But not everyone watching the game tonight will be watching for football. Some people will be tuning in simply to see uh, the investment that many companies make in producing humorous or, or out-of-the-ordinary television ads. Others will be tuning in simply to watch the performance at the halftime show. No doubt others will simply be watching because Taylor Swift will be present watching Travis Kelsey uh, try to win another Super Bowl. Now, there's something important we need to get straight right from the start. None of those are reasons for watching football. <laughs> the reason for watching football is, is, is the competition. It, it, it's the game. It's the big plays that you see, the big hits that take place. All these other things just, just are distractions. They, they, they draw attention away from what's actually going on from, from the game. Something of this is going on in the passage that we read. Because as we uh, consider this portion of Acts, there's really two responses uh, to a particular event that we want to see. Two responses, two places where people can place their wonder, can place their amazement. Two points as we go through this, this portion. First, we want to see wayward wonder. And then secondly, worshipful wonder. Wayward wonder and worshipful wonder. First of all, we will consider wayward uh, wonder in verses 9 through 25. Uh, we ended last week, or if you look just in the, the, the portion of chapter 8 uh, before uh, what we read, uh, Philip, uh, one of the, the seven who was appointed to, to take care of the needs of, of widows in Jerusalem, uh, has spread out from Jerusalem along with many others. There's intense persecution taking place. And, and Philip goes north, we said, from Jerusalem to Samaria and begins uh, preaching uh, the gospel of Jesus. He begins preaching about uh, what Jesus has done to save people. And we read that many in, in Samaria believe him. They, they, they trust in Jesus as their savior. But then in verse 9, we're introduced to someone else who is coming on the scene, another a person who's significant for this portion, and that is a man named Simon. We meet him right away at verse 9. Simon, uh, who's known as Simon the Sorcerer, uh, Simon the Magician. Uh, church history also calls him Simon Magnus. And this guy's a big deal uh, in Samaria. If you read uh, the details about him, we read that he's, he's practicing magic in the city. He's, he's amazed, he's astounded uh, the citizens uh, of Samaria with, with his tricks, with his magic. He, he has celebrity status uh, here uh, in this city and in this region. He thinks he's a big deal. He makes sure people know that he's a big deal. And besides that, many other people uh, see him as a god or, or at least as some divine figure uh, sent uh, by God. And so crowds gather around him for a long time. Many people, large groups of people, are, are following him, amazed by him. But then Philip comes on the scene. 
And Philip uh, begins teaching about this Jesus and what this Jesus did. And along with that, Philip starts casting demons out of people. He starts healing people. Sick people become better in an instant. People that can't walk begin to walk. Uh, and, and beyond that, people start following him and they, they believe the message that he's, he's bringing. And the result is that they then stop following Simon. But we read in verse 13, if you notice in verse 13, we read that even Simon himself believes. We'll dig into that later, uh, but Simon, uh, we're told Simon believes, we're told he is baptized, we're told he keeps following Philip. There's one detail I want to point your attention to right at the end of verse 13, if you have your Bibles open or if we can get that on the screen for a moment. The last line of verse 13 uh, we read that he's seeing great uh, signs and great miracles performed, and he was amazed. What interests Simon, what draws his attention, is the miracles that are being performed. And this continues as, as we read uh, in verse 14 and following that, that Peter and John come, these apostles uh, from Jerusalem, hear the news that, that Samaritans are believing in Jesus as their Savior. And so uh, Peter and John come, they come and, and they pray, they lay their hands on people, and, and the Holy Spirit comes on uh, the people of Samaria in a very visible, in a very tangible way. It's like Pentecost for the Samaritans. And this once again catches Simon's attention and draws his interest, draws his amaz amazement. And so he comes to Peter and he offers him money in order to be able to, to send the Holy Spirit on whomever he wants. So what do we make of Simon? How do we understand uh, the, this, this character that shows up uh, in Luke's account of what's going on in Samaria. Well, one, we have to, to, to realize what Luke is doing as, as he writes. Luke, the human author, is, is, seems to be drawing our attention to the fact that it's, it's not the gospel that Simon's drawn to. It, it's signs, it's wonders, it, it's miracles. He's, he's awed and, and fixated on the wonderful things that Philip is doing rather than the wonderful Jesus that Philip is preaching about. And so what does it mean that he believed? Is this true repentance? Is this true faith? Is this true brokenness before God because of his sinful condition and crying out to God for help and for deliverance? It seems unlikely, given the emphasis. As he follows Philip, He's paying attention to what Philip's doing. He's paying attention to the miracles, to the signs. Perhaps given his, his career, given his, his profession, he, he's watching. He realizes that Philip has access to some amazing power that he doesn't know about. Uh, and, and Simon wants to tap into that. He wants to learn a trick or two that he can from Philip. Even more so, it seems that he's treating this as a business opportunity. Commentators note that magicians at this time would, would often buy and sell information from each other. They would offer money in order to, to, to gain a new trick, be able to add a new magic trick to their repertoire. And that's what it seems Simon is doing here. He offers Peter money to be able to lay his hands on people uh, and, and give them the Holy Spirit. He's seeing it as a business investment. He wants to add another side to, to his business. In summary, Simon's not trusting in Jesus. Instead, he's interested in what Jesus can give him. He's not so much interested in the message of the gospel. He's interested in the signs and wonders that are going along with that. To use our opening illustration, he's interested in the halftime show. He's not interested in the football game itself. I think there's so many ways that this challenges us. Uh, whoever you are, it challenges us if you've grown up, into church, grown up in church. It challenges us as a culture. Because at various times uh, in our, our walk with Jesus, we can approach our faith. We can uh, approach the Bible. We can approach the message of the gospel even uh, 
with this attitude of, of what it does for us. And think of it uh, in this way, per- perhaps you've experienced this, where you're going through a difficult time, you're going through a trial, and you think, I go to church, I put my money in the offering, I volunteer in many programs in the church, God, why are you doing this to me? Why is this, this happening? In some way, if that's our heart response, we're, we're in it, we're, we're showing that we're in this for what God can give us. We want this peaceful, we want the, this easy life. And when we don't get that, we're angry and we're upset at God. We're in it for what God can give us. Or if you've been a, a part of a church or, or coming to church, maybe you come with an attitude. It's easy to come with an attitude of what the church can do for me. What can the church uh, give me? Ultimately, we want the help and support of the church without serving, without giving in various ways. We're in it for a handout of some sort. We're in it for what Jesus can give us. We're not in it for Jesus himself. Or we can be be drawn away by, by... wrong emphases. We can uh, look at what other churches are doing, churches that seem to be successful and drawing all kinds of people, and we look at their ministry models, we look at what they're doing, and we think we need to copy that and and, and place it in our church, and, and then we'll be successful. Rather than trusting the, the ordinary and beautiful means that God gives us through his word, through prayer, through fellowship, to work, the the ways that he works in the hearts and lives of people. Maybe we're seeking quick fixes uh, for people that we're walking alongside of or or in evangelism as we seek to share the gospel. We want a a quicker solution than the relational coming alongside, being patient with people. What Simon is showing us here is that there's different ways to respond to the gospel. Ways that can seem so right, so similar uh, to the correct way. Simon follows the crowd. Simon's baptized even. And yet when Peter confronts him, Peter says, your heart's not right with God. You're not getting the point of what this message is all about. You're still enslaved to your idols. It struck me this week, looking through this passage, that this story about Simon ends in a cliffhanger. There's really no resolution to, to, to what happens with Simon. In verse 20 to 23, we get Peter's a strong rebuke. Peter warns him that he's not part of God's family. He calls him to repent, to seek God's mercy. But the passage doesn't end with Simon repenting. It ends with Simon asking Peter to pray for him so that bad things won't happen to him. Which once again betrays Simon's heart. He's more interested in being okay. He's more interested in bad things not happening to him than he is in truly repenting and truly coming to Jesus. He, he has no desire to, to turn away from his, his sin, to turn away from his greed, to turn away from his pursuit of magic. He doesn't want to give that all up in order to follow Jesus with everything that he is. This shows us the cost of the gospel, doesn't it? That the gospel calls us to change. That Jesus calls us to change. You see, the gospel isn't about uh, a few modifications to our behavior and then we're okay. It, it's not about, it's not calling us to add a few good deeds to, to the repertoire of how we live our lives and, and then we're good with God. It's not about picking and choosing the things we like about Jesus or the things we like in the Bible, blending it up all together and then we're, we're good to go. No, the gospel, Jesus himself calls us to wholesale change. He calls us to complete transformation. The gospel requires radical repentance, recognizing just how sinful we are, just how, how broken we are before God, just how deeply the, the effects of the fall run in our lives. And it calls us to get on our knees, whoever we are, daily, and acknowledge that. 
acknowledge our need before God, acknowledge our weakness, and to trust in Jesus alone for help, to trust in Jesus alone for salvation, that forgiveness, that a right standing with God only comes through Jesus. Anything else will crush us. This wayward wonder can't deliver on what it might promise. The miracles that Simon is looking for that he'd so desperately wanted would not have been able to satisfy him. And they won't satisfy us. It's really a tragic story. We don't read of Simon repenting. And early church history attributed uh, to Simon the rise of of various heretical uh, groups, groups that didn't focus on Jesus but twisted the word of God in various ways. But we're here. We're reading this story. And what I want each of us to see this afternoon is that this cliffhanger ending invites us into the story. It invites us into the story to, to truly repent, to do what Simon should have. To ask God to search our hearts, to lay before us uh, things that are not right in us so that we might truly repent, that we might truly turn to Jesus and seek with all our hearts to, to follow Jesus himself. To have our wonders aligned rightly. And that's what we see in the second portion of the passage that we read uh, in verses 26 to the end. We see what worshipful wonder is, our second point. Worshipful wonder couple things to notice about just the section as a whole and then how these these two uh, portions that we read this evening relate. This is a section dealing with Philip. Uh, He's the main human character, so to speak, that runs throughout uh, chapter 8. And what what Luke wants us to see, as as we've emphasized before, is that God is using Philip as a pioneer missionary of sorts. Philip is is bringing the news of Jesus outside of Jerusalem to Samaria and then to a man who will meet in a moment, this Ethiopian. There's also something interesting to compare or to notice in the fact that Luke puts these stories back to back. We first read of Simon, and then we read of this Ethiopian. And as we go through this section, we'll do some compare and contrast to, to see what Luke is seeking to show us in this, how they respond to the gospel. First, we need to see, meet who this man is. Uh, we read that, that Luke meets, or Philip rather, meets an Ethiopian. And he's an important man. He is a, a political uh, figure. He's in an important political position back in his homeland. One commentator describes him as the minister of finance in the Ethiopian uh, palace, in the Ethiopian government. He's a prominent person. He's a, a well-known, well-respected person, likely having some wealth. But we also read that he, he knows about God. He's likely what Acts refers to later on as, as a God-fearer. The God-fearers were, were those who were Gentiles. They were not Jewish. Uh, but they had had some contact with Jews. They were, were devoted uh, in certain ways to, uh, to the God of the Jews. And we read that in verse 27, that this man is even, even went to Jerusalem to worship and is now on his way back home. And furthermore, we find out he has a copy of the Bible, or or what would have been the Bible uh, to New Testament Christians. Specifically, he's reading uh, from the prophet prophet Isaiah, a portion that we would know as Isaiah 53. At this time, there weren't uh, chapter and verse divisions, so he wouldn't have known it as Isaiah 53. But uh, if you look in Isaiah 53, you can see this portion that he's reading, this portion that talks about Someone being led to the slaughter, like a sheep. This portion that that talks about uh, being denied justice. This portion that talks about a man uh, whose life is taken from the earth. And right away we see a difference here between Simon and this Ethiopian. This Ethiopian hasn't seen any miracles. He hasn't seen any wonders. He's simply reading the word of God. 
He's reading God's inspired, God's breathed out word, and he's seeking to understand what it says. Already we see that this is a man who is truly seeking God, uh, who's, who's, who's humbled, who knows there's something that he needs, that there's something that he needs to know and understand, and he needs help understanding it. It's such a contrast between the pride and the self-centeredness of Simon who was in it for what he could get, who was looking for for a new product, who was all about amazing signs and miracles. This man just has the word of God. He just has his Bible, we would say. And he's searching the Bible. He's seeking to know. He's seeking to understand. There's an interesting comparison here with with Jesus' ministry. As we consider uh, Philip's ministry to uh, the Samaritans and and then to this Ethiopian, there's a parallel with Jesus' ministry. If you would look in your Bibles uh, in John chapter 4, we'll compare two two accounts in, in the Gospel of John just to see that this isn't anything new. In Acts, and it's, it, it continues to be the case today. In John chapter 4, we read the account of, of Jesus talking to this woman uh, in Samaria. And as he, he talks to this woman, she slowly begins to see, her, her eyes are slowly opened to who Jesus actually is. She sees him, that he's the Messiah, and he believe, she believes this. And then she goes and tells her entire town that she's met this man who told her everything that she had ever done. And the town hears that. The townspeople hear that. They come and see Jesus, and they believe simply uh, because of Jesus' word. But if we would turn just two chapters forward uh, to John chapter 6, we read this amazing account early in John chapter 6 of, uh, of Jesus feeding, feeding the 5,000. He, he turned five loaves and two fish into enough uh, to feed 5,000 men, let alone, let alone women and children, and for there to be a basket, seven baskets uh, gathered after. He did an incredible sign, but then we read later on that the crowds find him the next day. And they come to Jesus looking for another miracle looking for another trick, looking for some magic, so to speak. And when Jesus doesn't deliver it, they leave. They were in it for the show. Whereas the Samaritans earlier were in it for Jesus. Once they understood, once they understood who he was and understood his word. As we consider this, the, the, the context of, of this Ethiopian draws us to ask, are we content with the Bible? Are we content with meeting Jesus in the inspired, the revealed word of God? Are we seeing it as that? That this is God's breathed out word to us and and we need to understand some principles to to correctly read to correctly interpret uh, the bible but the main message is clear the main message that philip's about to unpack for the samaritan the bible is the account of, of god saving his people That's the overarching framework. It's about a God who who delights to save his people, who to to defeat sin and evil, to bring people back to him, to redeem a world that has fallen and broken. That's what the Bible is. Do we treasure it? Do you read? Do you study your Bible? Do you seek seek to know deeply what God is saying to us in it? We're in an age where we have such access to the Bible on so many platforms and so many resources to understand what God's saying to us in it. It's really God's goodness and his hand in our lives. Do we value that? Do we treasure that the way that we should? We sang ancient words earlier and it's the last verse that always strikes me, that, that it's the pages of the Bible are stained with the blood of the martyrs. People gave their lives so that we could hold the Bible in our hands. Do we treasure it? Do, do we long to meet Jesus as we read the pages 
of the Bible. We see God's hand all over the account of this, this Ethiopian, Philip and this Ethiopian as well. Because at some point this man met Jews who, who told them about told him about their God. At some point, he longed to go to Jerusalem and eventually made the trek uh, to the temple to worship their God. And somehow he managed to get a scroll with the prophet, prophecy of Isaiah. And at just the, right, just the time that, that the Spirit of God leads Philip uh, to this man, he's reading a, a portion of the Old Testament that very clearly, as, Peter, as Philip's going to point out, leads him to Jesus. So Philip comes, he asks him if he understands what he's reading, and he says he doesn't. He needs someone uh, to teach him. That's exactly what Philip does. It's so interesting to read how Luke records this, that he began with the portion of Scripture that this, this man was reading, and from that he told him the good news about what Jesus had done. And this Holy Spirit continues to work in this man, in the heart of this Ethiopian, so that he truly believes. He's, he's, the Spirit's working through all the details of this passage. And so we see the beauty, again, of one of the overarching themes of, of Acts, that, that God himself, the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, are advancing God's mission. God continues to work faith in those who we would not expect him to. As we consider this, as we consider this, this Ethiopian, he holds out an example of, of correct priorities, of, of worshipful wonder. This man is concerned about understanding the truth. He's concerned about understanding the core of what Christianity is all about. He's reading his Bible. He's, he's spiritually hungry. He's heard a lot about this God of the Jews, but he hasn't yet met Jesus in his word. And God works in this man in an incredible way to meet that need, to meet that desire. So that Philip comes and he teaches him the gospel of Jesus. He teaches him the good news that, that, that it was Jesus who was the one led to the slaughter. That it was Jesus who was denied justice. That it was Jesus uh, who was killed. Also that we can be saved. It was Jesus who came and lived a perfect life in our place and died the death that we deserve. That's the message that Philip has for this man. It's the message that we need. It's the awe and wonder that we need. It's what this man desired. It's what he longed for. He longed for Jesus. There's a great story from England in the 1800s. There was a man named Herbert Spencer. Herbert Spencer was a, a sociologist. He was an agnostic, which means that he wasn't sure if there was a God or, or if there was a God. He, he didn't know if we could actually know this God. And one, one Sunday afternoon, he went to hear the British preacher Charles Spurgeon. Charles Spurgeon was a, a well-known preacher in London, England at the time. He was drawing huge crowds, and, and Herbert Spencer wanted to, to know what all the fuss was about. So he went, and he heard Charles Spurgeon preach. And then when he came back, one of his friends asked him, so how was Spurgeon? And Herbert Spencer replied, Oh, Spurgeon? I haven't been thinking about him. I've been occupied thinking about Spurgeon's Jesus. That's what this passage is pointing us to. That's how this passage ends. Simon missed him. But the Ethiopian comes to a true saving knowledge. He, he, he's in it uh, for Jesus, and he asks to be baptized. And as he comes out from the water, uh, Philip disappears. But, but the Ethiopian has been changed. His, his heart is new, and he goes home rejoicing in this message of salvation. He's truly met Jesus, and his awe and his wonder is all about Jesus. 
So what amazes you? What amazes us? What captures our hearts? What captures our desires? Now as we look at this passage, it's easy to see how this cuts both ways. There's so often times that we're like Simon. We're drawn away, we're, we're distracted, we're focusing on lesser things. But here's the good news. God, by his grace, God, by the spirit working in your heart and in my heart, is in the business of drawing us back, drawing our eyes to Jesus. Let's be open to that. Let's, let's pray that God would be gracious, that he would draw our eyes to him so that all our love and all our wonder is fixed on Jesus as our Savior and as our Lord. Let's pray together. Father, we do thank you for Jesus. We thank you for the grace and the work of your spirit in our lives and the lives of so many people around the world. Lord, we confess that we're so often Simons. We're so often drawn to to what you can do for us or what advantages we can receive. We're not drawn to Jesus ourselves. We pray that you would forgive us. Pray that you would soften our hearts, that you would turn us away from the things that so easily distract us, to, from the things that, that ensnare our hearts, so that we might be occupied, we might be preoccupied with thinking about Jesus, with thinking about what he has done, and that we, all our trust, all our faith, all our confidence would be in him. Lord, we pray that you'd be at work in each and every one of us. Lord, whether uh, we're exploring who Jesus is and what the Christian faith is about, or whether we've gone to church all our lives, Lord, we need the same spirit working in us, drawing us to our knees, uh, helping us to, to call out to you for grace and mercy. So would he do just that? And we ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen.